Coming up, life is winning. The head of the Susan B. Anthony list is battling for the unborn. Could the end of abortion be near? And then, four days out of detox, first time shooting heroin. On the way to the hospital, my heart stopped for 10 minutes. What saved this addict from a fatal overdose? Wow, the Lord must really love me. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome folks to this edition of the 700 Club. I believe it was the Greek philosopher Demosthenes who said, evil is good to those who the gods would destroy. The Romans had it a little bit differently. Whoever the gods would destroy, they first drive mad. Well, there was a madness yesterday, and it came on Donald Trump. And people had been hoping and hoping he had his his own people in the Senate all ready to fight for him. Congress was ready. Ted Cruz was ready. And so what does Trump do? He goes crazy. And he, he urges his huge crowd that came to Washington to support him to take a march on the Capitol. And suddenly there may have been some ringers that went into that group as well. We don't know if there were some people as well, but it, it, they took over the Capitol. They, 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 uh, they invaded the offices and, and just did a horrible thing. And um, instead of supporting him, now the people who were all lined up to, to have a hearing on every one of those voter fraud claims uh, was no longer able to do anything. They, they, they couldn't wait to vote against him. And you, you think also he went down into Georgia in that close election and told people the Republican governor was crooked, was fraudulent. The secretary of state was fraudulent, who's a Republican, was fraudulent. And he said, your votes won't count. And so he suppressed the vote in Georgia in those Republican areas that was so important. And so the two uh, senators went down in defeat in Georgia. Madness. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want you to know, and I want to say this very clearly, whatever happens, God Almighty is on the throne. And He is in charge, and He has the last word. I thought something was going to happen dramatic. Well, it did, but not quite exactly what I was predicting. But something did happen. But there's more that's, that's going to happen, and God is looking after us. And I, I would say to this audience right now, do not despair. God has the last word. He is in charge, and He will carry us through. We may be faced now with a situation that is not too pleasant for us, but maybe it will be. But the, we go back to pick up what happened yesterday and what sparked, what amounted to an insurrection. And how could it happen here in the U.S.? Well, I told you in a little, little advance about how come, but Heather Sells brings us our coverage with almost unbelievable images. Trump supporters marched to the Capitol after the president addressed the rally, some of them turning violent breaching the barricades and moving quickly into the Capitol building Wednesday afternoon. This video shows them simply overwhelming one officer on the first floor and making their way up to the Senate chamber where Vice President Pence was presiding over electoral college proceedings. Pictures show guards with guns drawn, crouching behind barriers to keep the intruders out of the legislative chambers. Lawmakers took cover on the floor and were told to put on gas masks. We were just told that there has been tear gas in the rotunda and we're being instructed uh, to each of us get a gas mask. In a moment that was unprecedented and unimaginable for many Americans, Capitol Police were forced to evacuate the vice president and members of the House and Senate. The lawmakers quickly made their way out to secure locations while the mob took over, 
posing in ludicrous shots in the Senate. Outside the Capitol, the protesters waved Trump flags and a big Jesus flag. They literally climbed up the walls, tore down metal barricades at the bottom of the Capitol steps, and forced police to back up on the steps, eventually taking over. Democrats and many Republicans blamed the president for the violence. No question that the president formed the mob, the president incited the mob. At a midday rally for his supporters, the president seemed to deliver a mixed message. You'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. In the late afternoon, President-elect Biden called out the mob for an insurrection bordering Sorry. on sedition and told the That's president to is. stop them. I call on President Trump to go on national television now to fulfill his oath and defend the Constitution and demand an end to this siege. Shortly after, right. Trump released a video right. on Twitter where he told the mob to go home, but also praised all them and me, condemned me, the election. This was a fraudulent election, but we can't play into the hands of these people. We have to have peace. So go home. We love you. You're very special. Twitter later pulled the video and locked down the president's account, citing its civic integrity policy. A long list of faith leaders also called out the mob, including Could Trump faith advisor ago, Robert Jeffress. Uh, disobeying and assaulting police is a sin, whether it's done by Antifa or by angry Republicans. One protester was killed after authorities shot her inside the Capitol during the chaos. Three others died from medical emergencies. Eventually, the National Guard arrived and used tear gas and percussion grenades to clear the Capitol. By nightfall, the crowds had largely dispersed. This morning on Twitter, via an aide, the president promised a, quote, orderly transition on January 20th. This after lawmakers returned last night to finish the task they started certifying Joe Biden's win in the Electoral College. CBN Washington correspondent Jenna Browder brings us that part of the story. Despite one of the most tumultuous days in the history of the U.S. Capitol, lawmakers determined to do their duty worked late into the night to count each state's votes and certify President-elect Joe Biden's victory. The report we make is that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will be the president and the vice president, according to the ballots that have been given to us. The end of a long, turbulent day that began hours earlier, with the president addressing thousands of supporters and calling on Vice President Mike Pence to disqualify some states' electoral votes. Because if Mike Pence does the right thing, we win the election. At almost the same time, Pence, who's president of the Senate, released a statement refusing to do so. My oath to support and defend the Constitution constrains me from claiming unilateral authority to determine which electoral votes should be counted and which should not. That followed by a moving speech from Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell on why it would be wrong to overturn the election. The voters, the courts, and the states have all spoken. They've all spoken. If we overrule them, it would damage our republic forever. Still, a group of Republican House and Senate members went forward with their objections to state electors. My challenge today is not about the good people of Arizona. And it will stand in recess until the call of the chair. We'll pause. Protesters are in the building. Thank you. That's when the chaos ensued. Lawmakers hunkered down behind locked doors and armed guards and told to don gas masks before being evacuated from the building. Hours later, after the Capitol was cleared, leaders announcing they'd be regathering in the evening to finish the job. To those who wreaked havoc in our Capitol today, you did not win. We will not bow to lawlessness or intimidation. 
Several lawmakers withdrew their objections to certification. Senator Mitt Romney commending them for their move toward unity. The best way we can show respect for the voters who are upset is by telling them the truth. That's the burden. That's the duty of leadership. Not all lawmakers dropped their objections, though, so the debate continued into the early morning hours until the votes were certified. President-elect Biden takes office January 20th. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Well, I want to say as clearly as I can, our hope is not in Donald Trump. Our hope is not in the Republican Party. The hope is not in any politician. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And this one who's in charge of this world, and believe me, nothing has taken him by surprise, because he's God Almighty, and he will answer the prayers of his people. I know many people are disappointed at what happened, and I think that had the president acted uh, more intelligently, I think we might have had a different result, because God had something planned that was going to be good. But uh, Donald Trump preempted that. He also preempted those like Ted Cruz and others who were ready to fight for him on the floor of the Senate. That's all over, and uh, the election is over, and it's done. And I think that we should now begin to say, well, all right, we're the people of God, we're the remnant, and we have had these times before in the history of mankind, and the remnant still wins. God is never going to lead his people. And I, I just want you to know that I am optimistic about the future because God's getting ready to do a wonderful thing throughout the world. And it has nothing to do with Donald Trump. It has nothing to do with the Republican Party. It has nothing to do with the Liberal Democratic Party. It has nothing to do with any politician. It has to do with God. And our hope is in the Lord. And I think that's what you and I need to recognize from this moment on, God is in control, and He still answers our prayers. And obviously, in this particular time, I'm, I'm go back to the time in history when God was in charge of the nation of Israel, and He had a prophet named Samuel. And the people said, we want a king like the other nations. And Samuel said, God has been your king. What's the matter with that? And they said, no, no, give us a king. And so the Lord said to Samuel, all right, they have rejected me. Now go get them a king and tell them how a king's supposed to operate. So God has said, the people have spoken here in America. This is what we want. We want a, a liberal government, and we want the policies they advocate. And God is going to say, I'm going to give it to you. You're going to have what you ask for. But keep in mind that I am still in charge. And so... I'm very hopeful. That I, 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 no way under heaven is any of this going to get me down because I believe in God Almighty and I believe in His power. And I'm telling you in this first new year that this is going to be one of the greatest years we have ever seen in CBN's history. We're going to have more people one to the Lord. We'll have more churches founded than ever before. And Regent University is going to have uh, its growth, the biggest growth in the history of the school. So, and, and throughout the evangelical world, we'll see huge numbers coming into our churches because they're going to say, all right, you've got the truth. We want the truth. And uh, the truth is in Jesus Christ. All right? Well, in other news, uh, in addition to what happened in Washington, the Georgia runoff is a done deal, and Democratic control of the Senate is almost certain. John Jessup explains that. Thanks, Pat. Democrats will control the Senate along with the House under a Biden administration. Democratic challenger John Ossoff has been declared the winner in his Senate runoff election in Georgia over Republican incumbent David Perdue. Ossoff will join his fellow Democrat, the Reverend Raphael Warnock, who also won his runoff race. Their victories mean the Senate is now tied at 50-50, giving Vice President-elect Kamala Harris the tie-breaking vote and Democrats' control of the Senate. Well, that control will smooth the way for President-elect Joe Biden's cabinet nominations, including a nominee once blocked by the Republican Senate. 
Biden named Judge Merrick Garland as his pick for attorney general. Garland is currently chief judge of the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. In 2016, President Barack Obama nominated him to the U.S. Supreme Court to fill Antonin Scalia's seat, but Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell refused to hold confirmation hearings. Well, turning now to the coronavirus, the United States set another one-day record for COVID deaths earlier this week. The number of fatalities attributed to the virus in a 24-hour period hitting 3,775. Since the pandemic began, COVID has claimed the lives of more than 375,000 people in the United States, and cases continue to surge. In L.A. County, California, officials telling residents there not to call 911 unless it's an absolute emergency. This is our kind of our worst nightmare. I've never heard of emergency departments literally refusing to accept ambulance patients. Meanwhile, the COVID rollout vaccines in the United States has been slower than expected. Only about a third of the doses distributed to each state has actually been given. Many governors are threatening fines if agencies with the vaccines don't get them into arms faster. Healthcare workers and nursing home residents, Pat, as you all know, have been the top priority. Well, I, I want to also say something, uh, you know, uh, Jesus gave us some signs of what's going to be the end of the age and his coming. And one of them has been, uh, you know, widespread. Well, I mean, you can use it. He didn't use the term pandemic, but I can do it. Uh, plagues, plagues. And in many places, you're going to have earthquake activity. You're going to have plagues. You're going to have unrest. You're going to have, well, the sea and the waves roaring. You're going to have the, the, the oceans turned uh, uh, against us and the signs in the heavens. It's all going to happen, but one of the things was a plague, and, it, and we're having plagues like never before, and famines like never before. I mean, this uh, COVID is a vicious, vicious killer, and uh, it's amazing how quickly people can get it, and it's also amazing what it does to their lungs once they do get it. So whatever you can do, I know the Lord will look after you, but at the same time, take it carefully and don't expose yourself any more than you have to. Well, there's some, I guess, good news. It has a prophetic significance. John's going to tell us about what's happening in the Sudan. That's right, Pat. Sudan has signed an agreement with the United States that paves the way for the African nation to normalize relations with Israel. It is the latest step in the peace deal known as the Abraham Accords, started by the Trump administration. Those agreements have seen three other countries in the Middle East normalize relations or open up diplomatic channels with Israel. U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin said at the signing in Khartoum Wednesday that the latest deal means a new era for both Sudan and Israel. It's a great honor to be here with you today, and I think we'll have a tremendous impact on the people of Israel and the people of Sudan as they continue to work together on cultural and economic opportunities. Mnuchin also signed a memorandum of understanding to help pay Sudan's debt to the World Bank. Last month, the United States removed Sudan from the list of state sponsors of terror. Both moves will help rehabilitate uh, Sudan, Pat, which was once considered a pariah nation. Well, is that an interesting thing? I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, Kush is supposed to be a part of the uh, uh, group that's going to come against Israel in the last days. And I think we're getting very close to that, but uh, uh, that uh, Sudan was the South Sudan is a more or less Christian area. The North Sudan uh, is was heavily Muslim, and uh, the fact that they're coming along with Israel, I mean, I, I'm not sure how long that one is going to last. You always hope for peace if you can, but I would question that one because it doesn't seem to co coincide with Ezekiel 38. Terry? Well, up next, to take the COVID vaccine or not, why do half of Americans say no way? The bigger issue, can the government force you to take it? Plus, rush to the hospital, her heart not beating for 10 minutes. Why was this young woman put in a medically induced coma? She'll tell you her harrowing story. That's coming up. Hi, this is Pat Robertson. We don't know what the future holds for different tech companies, but we always want to be able to share the good news through the media. 
So I want to invite you to watch our program on cbnfamily.com or download the CBN Family app. This way you can have direct access to the 700 Club and other specials from CBN and you won't miss a thing. Now just click below to get more details and watch with us. Tomorrow, the eight-time All-Star and four-time World Series champ, baseball icon Daryl Strawberry opens up on what destroyed his career and what saved his life. And then... And it sounds like a freight train running right over me. Two snowboarders are caught in an avalanche. All of a sudden, everything starts to let go. Their supernatural search and rescue. There's no way I'm ever going to find him. On the next 700 Club. Stay connected with CBN News all day across our platforms. Well, here's a question for you. Would you plan to take the COVID-19 vaccine if it's made available to you? Do you realize half of the American people say, no way, we're not going to do it? Well, the big question, could you be forced to take it? And if you refused, could you be for fined, forbidden to travel, or even denied work? Wow. Could that happen in America? Dale Hurd has the answer. The COVID-19 vaccine has arrived, and some are applauding it, but some are not. Half of Americans say they don't want to get the vaccine, according to a December poll, although more recent polling shows more might be willing to get it now. But Republicans are nearly twice as likely as Democrats to not want the vaccine. I think the vaccine is a great thing for people who are really scared about the virus. And if they want to take the vaccine because they feel like they're going to be safe from it, then by all means do it. But me personally, I'm OK. I am not worried about the coronavirus. No. As a matter of fact, I'd rather get it over with. You know, I, I might have already had it already. But what if you don't have a choice whether to get the vaccine or not? Could the government force you to get a COVID vaccine? That depends on your definition of force. In the landmark case Jacobson versus Massachusetts in 1905, the Supreme Court ruled that the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts could fine residents who refused to receive smallpox vaccinations. Dr. Bradley Jacob is a constitutional law expert at Regent University. The court did not rule that the government can hold you down on a table and force a syringe into your arm even if you refuse. They simply said people who choose not to get the vaccine might have to pay a fine. But businesses and schools can require vaccinations of employees, customers, and students. There's a big difference between what the government can do and what a private business or private party can do. An employer can force you to vaccinate and say, if you want to come to our workplace, do this job, you have to get a vaccination. A public school can require the students to vaccinate. They already do require lots of vaccinations. But some of America's largest businesses say they will only encourage employees to get vaccinated in order to respect personal beliefs and to avoid medical liability if an employee is injured by the vaccine. But it's looking more and more likely that if you want to travel, especially internationally, you will have to get the vaccine. We are looking at changing our terms and conditions to say for international travelers uh, that we will ask people to have a vaccination before they can get on the aircraft. The airlines are testing an app called Common Pass, which would show whether a traveler has been vaccinated. It was developed by the World Economic Forum, the same people who are pushing the Great Reset. If you don't need the vaccine to work or to travel and you're considered low risk, some are asking if it's wise to take a new vaccine for an illness with about a 99% survival rate for most people, according to CDC statistics. Silicon Valley technologist Enon Weiss has become a leading authority on COVID-19 and says he won't be first in line to get this vaccine saying there aren't enough studies about possible long-term complications. If somebody is very vulnerable, I can see why they would be eager for the vaccine. But for people who are low risk, I would like to see some long-term data on the vaccine. And you won't be able to sue Pfizer or Moderna if you're damaged by the vaccine. 
they've been given total immunity from liability. And Weiss wonders if we'll have to be vaccinated again when the next coronavirus comes along. People call this a once in a century pandemic, but it's really not. Based on the numbers, it's a once a generation event. Because we've had other pandemics, but for whatever reason, society didn't decide to shut down the world over it. The lockdowns have already sparked violent protest in Europe and Great Britain. And any attempt by governments to force citizens to get vaccinated will likely spark even more. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Wow. Are you going to get it? Probably not. Probably. <laughs> right. Well, I think that's the answer of a whole lot of people. I don't think they've tested that rascal enough to see the long-term consequences. You know, it's taken years for some yeah. things to be approved by the FDA, and given years of testing, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you, you know, uh, we had a, uh, in my hometown in Lexington, Virginia, they had the polio, mm -hmm. you know, polio. Yes. And, and people were paralyzed with it. And they had some shots that had live virus. And the mother of one of our friends took that and contracted polio and became paralyzed. So uh, that vaccine was not too good. And we don't know. I hope this one works. And we do hope so. So the last thing is I'm going to do is tell people not to do it. But I do think there are a lot of people who are not too sure yet of the long-term effects of this vaccine. I agree. I agree. Yeah, I hope, I hope it works. I really do. All right, what you got? Well, still ahead, meet a staunch supporter of abortion rights who made the switch to the other side. What picture made her change her mind? And why is she convinced that life is winning? Up next, complete fear at the mercy of a deranged, head-banging relative. What happened to this young woman when she was just nine years old? Find out after this. Hi, we hope you enjoyed this. Please subscribe to our channel so we can bring you more of the content you like. Grabbed by the hair, head smashed against a bench. Dina Cafiso was only a child when a family member repeatedly terrorized her. By the time she was 21, Dina had checked herself into a psych ward. So what happened next? Dina took a dance with death. They rushed me to the hospital. On the way to the hospital, my heart stopped for 10 minutes, and then they put me in a medically induced coma. It was a string of bad choices that put Dina Cafiso in a fight for her life. In a search for love and acceptance, Dina had turned to drugs to help numb the pain of childhood abuse, memories that haunted her for as long as she could remember. I grew up in complete fear uh, in my own house. The abuse? physical and verbal, had come from a close family member who was mentally ill. It was the worst of his abuse she remembered most. He barged in and actually broke the lock on my door, and then he grabbed me by the hair, and he smashed my head on this bench in my room, and I have a permanent bump on my head from that. And so there was this constant pressure of um, needing to survive. Dina says family members knew about the abuse, but did nothing to stop it. That not only made me feel unsafe, but it also caused me to actually have a strong hate towards these people who were supposed to protect me, but didn't. By the time she was nine years old, Dina was experiencing anxiety and depression. At 15, she made the decision to follow Christ. I heard my youth pastor's testimony of how he had come out of a life of drugs and gangs and all this stuff. And I remember thinking like, wow, like if the Lord can do that for him, then what could he do for me? But when the abuse continued. I thought I wasn't worthy to be loved by anybody. And that even translated into how I saw God, that 
He loved everybody else, but he definitely didn't love me because the, the people who were supposed to love me didn't love me. Soon, Dina turned away from God and started looking for love and acceptance through alcohol, sex, weed, and prescription drugs. She also started hurting herself. It was like an emotional release um, was happening that I could only get from inflicting the physical pain. Still, Dina wanted a better life, and after high school, she enrolled in a community college and got a job at a clothing store. But it was short-lived. She started dating a guy who gave her drugs, but more importantly, filled her need to be loved. When her boyfriend broke up with her, she became suicidal. Everything that I gave myself to, again, just kind of disappeared and vanished and abandoned me, and that I had nothing left to live for. At 21, Dina checked herself into a psych ward where she was diagnosed with several emotional disorders and anxiety. And I felt more worthless than I ever have in my entire life. After her release a week later, Dina went back to abusing pain pills that would lead her into a two-year addiction that now included cocaine. Still, she knew she needed help and went into a detox program that briefly got her clean but it did nothing to help her deal with the turmoil in her heart and mind. I cried out to God, and again, I said, God, if you love me, then can you rescue me out of this? If you love me, then help me. I need your help. Four days after getting out of detox, she decided to do something she had never done before and shot up with heroin. That was the last thing she remembers. I just saw all like the IVs hooked up to me, and the tube in my throat and I couldn't even move my left hand. It was stuck shut um, because I had severe nerve damage in my arm. Dina learned she almost died from a drug overdose and had been in a medically induced coma for a week. If not for a family member finding her in time to call 911, she would have died. When I finally realized what I had done to myself, I knew two things that I needed to change or I was gonna die addicted to drugs. And the second thing was, wow, the Lord must really love me in order to have saved me when I overdosed. Soon after, Dina rededicated her life to God. And I asked God to forgive me and took full responsibility for the things that I had done that were sinful and not pleasing. I released everyone in my family who had hurt me and neglected me, and I forgave them. And such freedom came from that, that I don't hold anything against them. Today, Dina serves on the worship team at her church. She's also a full-time seminary student. She says she never ceases to be amazed at what God has done in her life. No matter what we face, no matter how impossible, our situations and circumstances may feel, no matter how deep you are, you are never too far out of the reach of God. And He is more than willing to go down the deepest pit to rescue His people who He loves. I love that statement. It doesn't matter how deep the pit is, you're never out of the reach of God. You know, I want to say God loves you. He really does. He loved Gina, but he's there with you. We, we don't have a Savior who's not touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but was touched in all manner like we are, yet without sin. He suffers. He suffers for Dina. He suffers for all of his children because he loves us. He really cares, and he cares about you. And the thing about Dina, it wasn't her fault. I mean, some relative was beating her up, and she said, God, can you get me out of this? And then, of course, the way out was for her was to have a, a drug overdose, and that didn't do it. But the, these teenage girls, they start cutting themselves. They start hurting themselves. They become anorexic. There's so many ways they, they try to get out of the pain. But the biggest thing is there's a heart cry like, does God love me? Does anybody love me? And the answer is, yes, God loves you. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So I say to you this day, as we start a new year, God loves you. And he won't take back his love because he showed it on the cross when he died for you. And so he can't revoke that love. He, he died. It's all done. You don't have to keep killing Christ over and over again. He died once for the sins of mankind. and He died for you and for me. And if you receive him, he will give you everlasting life. And you will have joy unspeakable and full of glory. So I ask right now, would you pray with me wherever you are? Like Dean, I just bow your head and say, look, let's let it all go. I know you've been hurt. God knows you've been hurt, but what he wants you to do is forgive. And if you'll forgive, he will just pour out his love into your heart. So would you pray with me right now? I'm going to pray for you. And if you would pray along with me, wherever you are, these words, and God will hear and answer. Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, you know what I've been through. You know what I've been hurt. You know the cry of my heart. And Lord, you know the resentment I felt against those who hurt me. And you know the anger that is within me. But God, I want you. I need your love. And I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross for me and that you rose again that I might have everlasting life. So right now, Jesus, I surrender my hurts to you. I forgive those who have offended me and hurt me, and I receive your love into my life. And right now, at this moment, I give my heart to you, and I receive you as my Savior. Thank you, Lord. Now, I want to pray for you right now, wherever you are. Just bow your head. Father, thank you for those who prayed that prayer with me. May the anointing of the Holy Spirit rest upon them from this moment on. In Jesus' name, fill them. Amen. Now, if you prayed with me, it's the start of a wonderful journey. And uh, I want to give you something that will help you. We've had it. I did a teaching some time ago. I went into our audio room, and I did about 73 minutes of very intense teaching about what it means to be have a new life, what it means to be born again. And I'll give this to you. It's a little packet. It has the scriptures on the one hand, and I've got a, a, a audio CD right now. And we'll give you that free if you want to call in. It won't, no money involved. Just call and say, listen, I just prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord. And the number is 1-800-700-7000. Got that? 1-800-700-7000. And just say, I just prayed with that guy on TV, and I have come to the Lord Jesus. Okay? It's a great time, and the angels of heaven are rejoicing over this decision you just made. All right? Terry, what you got? Well, still to come, a YouTube favorite, your questions and Pat's honest answers. Colleen wants to know, is it safe for Christians to do yoga? Pat weighs in on that. That's later on. Plus, are you discouraged by the abortion battle underway in our country? Take heart. Pro-life crusader Marjorie Dannenfelser says life is winning, and she'll tell you why. That's coming up. He founded a global ministry, interviewed world leaders, was a leading presidential candidate, and he has walked with the living God. In Pat Robertson's latest book, discover the principles that guided this extraordinary life and how they can shape your future. Get Pat Robertson's highly acclaimed book, I Have Walked with the Living God, coming January 11th. Welcome back.
back to Washington for the CBN News Break. City officials in Louisville, Kentucky fired two more officers involved in last year's police raid, resulting in the death of Breonna Taylor. The city also hired the former chief at, of, of Atlanta to lead Louisville's police department. The hiring of Erica Shields comes after months of unrest over the deadly shooting of Taylor. Officials fired Detective Miles Cosgrove, who is accused of shooting Taylor, and Detective Joshua Janes, who sought the warrant that led to the raid. Well, an Ohio Federal's Appeals Court is backing a network of Christian schools after Lucas County health officials ordered all schools closed to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. Schools fought back in court, calling the mandate unconstitutional, saying it disregards medical data showing that schools are safe for children. A three-judge panel on the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals granted an injunction against the health department. The school network leader called it a victory for families and religious freedom and against government overreach. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Do you have questions about God? Call us. It's toll free. 1-800-700-7000 or check out this link. A necessary evil. That's what Marjorie Dannenfelser was taught to believe about abortion, and for years she did. So how did one picture change all that? Take a look. Marjorie Dannenfelser was a staunch pro-choice Republican for years, until she was faced with a life-altering question that changed her mind. The argument that stopped me in my feet the thing that made me turn around and walk back my own weak arguments was the one question pointing to that picture saying, what is that you are looking at? I was speechless. Since then, she has thrown herself into the battle to end abortion as the president of the Susan B. Anthony List. She has worked with presidents and other political leaders in the fight to save the unborn, which she shares in her book, Life is Winning. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Marjorie Dannenfelser. Marjorie, great to have you with us. Thank you. What a joy to be with you. Will, will you talk a little bit more about exactly what you were taught about abortion growing up? Yeah, well, I think the most important thing is that we really didn't discuss it much at all. Even though it was a raging issue in the culture, our dinner table conversations talked about everything else. Um, and if the A word ever did come up, it was considered a, uh, a necessary evil, something that, you know, it's a shame that that has to happen, but, um, but people have to have the power to move on with their lives, regardless of, um, of whether they, uh, and, and be able to choose whether you want to have children or not. That's how I thought about it. And then I also thought about it as a, um, something that I knew, uh, because I didn't see it as any problem, that I would definitely have an abortion if I ever thought that I, quote, needed one. And uh, so my body, my choice, that really shallow mantra of the feminist movement, even though I was pretty Republican and conservative in other areas, really took hold of me. And I think, wow, it's good when you pick a really shallow premise because it's pretty easy to destroy with God's grace, which did happen. Well, you know, I think also it's pretty easy to have an opinion about something if you've never been in a situation where it actually needs to be addressed by you. During college, you went through a pregnancy scare yourself. What made you feel furious at that point? I thought, well, I felt like a trapped animal. And I was going to do uh, freshman orientation just in a few days, didn't leave my room, did not know what was going on until I decided to deal with this with my, um, with my mom and dad. And we decided, you know, if, if uh, is, it's, quote, necessary, then we'll have it all set up. But I still didn't know. And so we walking into freshman orientation at Duke, I went and made the call uh, to find out, which I thought it would be positive, and then to set up the abortion. As it turned out, with God's grace and mercy, um, I was not. But what made me furious was other people that thought they could make that decision for me, that somehow um, they, because only I would have to bear the consequences and not they, made me furious that, uh, that anybody could tell me what to do with my life, my decisions, my choices in my body. You talked about it a little bit in that video intro that we did, but how did a picture radically change your point of view? Yeah, you know, so then, um, you know, 
God loves the word never. I, I said many times in my own advocacy that I would never embrace the pro-life argument because I thought it was anti-freedom. But then because of that, so many people that were good people, non-judgmental people, smart people at Duke, and then in D.C. also, just kind of took on the premise of what I was talking about. Uh, and I wasn't talking about what we were absolutely what we were actually talking about the the object, the target, the substance. What makes a, an abortion an abortion involves what? And if you're not willing to look at that picture, look at that thing, the object of an instrument of death. Now we know, and say what is that that's happening? Then you can't really have an informed position, and you shouldn't be advocating. Um, and so I did sort of get cornered spiritually, intellectually, emotionally on that particular issue. Um, and uh, and God used all those circumstances for me to be able to get to a result on that very question. I could not say that this is not a human being. I could only say everything about it seems like the beginning of every one of us and has the same potential as all. So my work in philosophy and other, other places turned me and then I fell hard after that. Talk about the progress the Susan B. Anthony list has made in the battle against abortion, because things have changed over the last few years. They, they really have. And like every other great human and civil rights movement of this country, there is a time where there is a raw, organic belief that has not been expressed politically or culturally in a, in a really loud and conclusive way. Um, and, I th and that is what we set out to do at Susan B. Anthony List, to express the deep pro-life roots of this country through our political process given to us by our founders in order to fix a great human rights wrong. And that means that our desire and our um, to put uh, pro-life protections in the law is the extension of who we are and what our Constitution is. So our goal was to do this very um, simple and very hard thing. Elect a president, elect a Senate, uh, who will fill the courts with pro-life judges, judges that see the Constitution as we do, so that then we can have cases that are headed to the court um, all over the country, so that there will be a moment where we overturn Roe versus Wade, and then we have the power back to enact pro-life protections all over the country. That very process, the process of doing everything that I just said, is what rights movements do. And as that is happening, it brings the good news and transforms the nation into what now we see is an emerging pro-life nation. It's young, vibrant, persistent, and we're getting very close to victory. And it's really an incredible uh, testimony to what God can do um, when, we, when we, I think, think strategically smart turning, is turning out to be the right thing to do. And that's what's happening right now willing to do what you did, which is examine our position on something and really be honest with ourselves about the reality of it. Your book, I want people to know, is called Life is Winning. It's available wherever books are sold, Inside the Fight for Unborn Children and Their Mothers, and I highly recommend it. So good to have Marjorie with us today. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Well, coming up, we've got your email questions. Angelique says, I'm angry and frustrated. I don't think Jesus hears my prayers and I'm under attack from evil. What do I do? Stay tuned. Pat's got some advice after this. We want to hear your story. Send us a message or call us 1-800-700-7000. Well, it's time for your questions and some honest answers. And Pat, this first one comes from Colleen, who says, is it safe for Christians to do yoga? Well, let me address it two different ways. Stretching exercises are quite good. There's nothing that says you can't do Pilates and stretching and, and all those uh, yoga things. But they also have a mantra that you're supposed to say while you're doing yoga. and people don't realize, but it's a prayer in Hindi to a Hindu god. And so what you're doing is letting yourself open to demonic uh, pressure. There's nothing wrong with doing stretching exercises. <laughs> I mean, if you want to call it yoga, that's so cool. it's cool. But when you start talking about a mantra, then you're into a totally different world and you don't want to do that, all right? 
This is Angelique Pat who says, I'm angry and frustrated. I don't think Jesus hears my prayers and I'm under attack from evil. What do I do? Well, I think first of all, you need to declare yourself a child of God. And you say, look, I belong to the zoo, the, the Lord. And you say, Satan, I bind you in the forces of evil. That, that's what you do. You, you, you bind the devil. And then you begin to receive what God has for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and he'll give you the answers to your prayer. Uh, he really will. I mean, the, you know, hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive. So open your heart and then begin to believe that you're going to receive something from the Lord and he'll give it to you. Right? This is Rita who says, my grandsons are six and eight years old. They were watching the Superbook app and it asked the question, do you want to know God? The eight-year-old immediately said yes. Then the six-year-old said, I want to too. I would love for this to happen, but thought I might need to talk to their parents. Are my grandsons too young? No way. Once they begin to have a heart toward the Lord, remember he said, start for the little ones that come unto me for such is the kingdom of God. He said, there are angels always behold the face of my Father in heaven. So little children, the minute they, their hearts are out to, to the Lord, by all means, let them find the Lord. You don't have to ask permission, in my opinion, of anybody. Right. This is Karen who says, we're to forgive continually as Christians, but what if you feel a person takes advantage of this? They act as though they can continue in negative behaviors because they assume you'll always forgive. They appear to use this as an excuse not to change. How should a Christian respond? Well, you remember what the Lord said, if somebody offends against you and he comes back and he says, I'm sorry, how often do you forgive him? Seven times seven, 70. So it's, a, it's an unlimited uh, uh, forgiveness. But at the same time, if somebody's just playing head games with you, then you need to deal with that and say, look, you are really just playing heads games with me. You're not really repenting. You're not really sorry for what you did. And let's, let's, let's get right. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't hurt to tell somebody the truth and get the truth out, all right? This is Marie who says, I was watching a pastor on TV who stated that Jesus no longer has dominion or power here on earth because he gave that up when he ascended into heaven and lost his earthly body. Is this true? You know, I wonder how guys like this get into the pulpit and say the stuff they say. The Lord said before he left, said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go ye therefore. I mean, he gave nothing up. He said, all authority has been given, all, all dominion, all power, uh, uh, you know, has been given to me. And he said that just before he left, all right? So the idea that he, he gave it all up, you know, the Lord one day is going to deal with these charlatans that are in the pulpit teaching this nonsense. And it's, it, it just grieves me when I hear about it so many times, all right? This is Julie who says, I'm stressed that we're living in the end times and that many of us aren't saved. What must we do exactly to be born again? And once we are born again, what must we do to remain saved? Well, uh, once you are uh, uh, the Lord, you're adopted into the family of God. But you, you the Bible it talks about emptying himself. He emptied himself. And, and we empty ourselves and we fill it with the Lord and we, 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 we turn away. The old man is dead, the new man comes alive. So that's the idea of being born again. Our whole body is changed. We become a new creature in Christ. And once that happens, then, well, you continue to walk with him. If you walk in the light, as he is in the light, you, can, you have fellowship and he, the, the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses you from sin. Wow, I wish we had more time to talk, but unfortunately, uh, the clock is ticking, and that's all the time we've got. So thanks for those questions. Well, today's Power Minute, we leave you with the words of Jesus from the book of John. I have come that they might have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. Tomorrow, what is QAnon, and why are so many people being hoodwinked by it? Well, we'll find out. Maybe I'll learn something, too, because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure right now I've got the answer. Tomorrow, we'll give it to you. So for Terry and all of us, Pat Robertson, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Tomorrow, the eight-time All-Star and four-time World Series champ, baseball icon Daryl Strawberry opens up on what destroyed his career and what saved his life. And then...
and it sounds like a freight train running right over me. Two snowboarders are caught in an avalanche. All of a sudden, everything starts to let go. Their supernatural search and rescue. There's no way I'm ever going to find him. On the next 700 Club. From Marine lieutenants in the Korean War to building a global ministry, Pat Robertson reveals how God has directed him every step of the way. In his latest book, I Have Walked with the Living God, Pat Robertson shares his personal journey of faith and how an ordinary life can become extraordinary when surrendered to God. In this highly acclaimed book, you'll learn the keys to receiving daily favor, wisdom, and blessing how to overcome setbacks and lean on God, how you can hear from God in your own life. Plus, enjoy fascinating untold stories from Pat's experiences in business and the political spotlight. Discover how life with God can be exhilarating and full of promise. Get your copy of I Have Walked with the Living God when you become a CBN partner. Coming January 11th.